This just in, a heist has been reported in Back Bay, as a man worked to discover he was missing a significant portion of his bank account. Officials are currently working to find any potential suspects from this case. The biggest jewelry heist ever hit Germany yesterday with an estimated $1 billion. All right, hold up, hold up. Let's start off by talking about the victim, Michael Ross. Earlier this year, Michael woke up to find out $69,420 had gone missing from his bank account. Panicked, he immediately reached out to try and get to the bottom of what had happened. Yo, bro, I am tweaking out right now. I have no idea what just happened last night. I woke up this morning and I was missing $69,420. $420. That is a load of money, dude. That is 138,840 donuts at 7-Eleven. That's a ton of donuts. I am so fucked, man. I really need your help. We got to find out who did this and we got to get my fucking money back. Give me a call back ASAP. At only 21 years of age, Ross has established himself as an extremely gracious philanthropist for the people of Amishville, Virginia. In just three years since arriving, Ross has become one of the largest contributors to the Amish community in the area, earning him the name Manoso Mike from the locals. However, having been from the suburbs of New Jersey, the transition to Amish culture was a shock to many. I thought he was Jewish. I remember Ross very well. That was one of my, my boys in high school. I mean, talk about going separate ways. Why did Mikey move to Amishville, Virginia? He never really shook me as someone who had moved to Amishville. He had already offended so many demographics, so many cultures. I mean, Mikey can't swim. He can't start a fire. He can't even raise a fucking barn. Oh, the Amish are supposed to do all of these things and, and he can't do a single one to save his life. Regardless of others' opinions, Ross was still very much involved in school. As captain of the varsity basketball and baseball teams, he was still able to manage his time to be a part of other groups, such as the Men's Puppety Society and the Eagle Scouts. He's a pretty good student, I think, I would say. Yeah, Mikey got so much done in high school. Part of the reason Ross and I were so close in high school was because both of us really had a tendency to just get shit done. Got good grades, as I've heard, did his work on time. He always looked like a dedicated student. Although Ross had contributed a lot to the community, people started focusing on his negative actions, as seen in the controversial 2018 film, Mikeumentary. Dr. Hoffman was asking uh, Mike Ross, I think it's something about the blood, maybe. And then, Mike just flipped off. He just called Mr. Hoffman's like, red and ass. And everyone, everyone just like, wow, 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 this is too much. And Doc, Mr. Hoffman just like, super surprised. And he just starts screaming. After the release of this documentary, Ross came into heavy fire for the real intentions of his contributions. People began to wonder if all his good deeds were just to save face for his booming drug business. Mike was, was a hell of a business partner. I remember how we got our start. I mean, Mikey and I, you know, we were close, you know, a lot of classes together. I mean, you know, so one day he, he brought this mystery white powder into to AP history class in the back of the room. And, before I know it, he's taking his Amex card and just chopping it up, and the next thing I know, he's taking a fat gator tail off George Washington's face. And then he's like, yo, Bruce, you gotta give this a go, man. And he's all bug out. He's like, you know, he's talking how much he wants to learn about Harry Truman and how he uh, nuked Japan. And I, I did it too, and by, and by, by God, it was life-changing. And that's when I knew this was the best shit we could have gotten. You know, and, and Mikey, Mikey has connections. There's a reason that his Amish friends call him on Yoso Mike. 
proceeded to bring so much into it after I realized just how much of a game changer this was. He, and it was the first time in my life I could genuinely say I printed. That's why I like money so much. I fucking printed with Mike to the tune of $250,000. I mean, he, we generated so much demand and after we graduated, well, you gotta do what you gotta do. You go your separate ways and that's what happened. Mike's drug business was nothing short of successful. Somehow, Mike was able to generate tons of demand for his drugs in suburban New Jersey. Experts estimate his New Jersey operation earned upwards of 250 grand. With such a successful start, Ross was able to get in contact with multiple cartels to bring their business to Amishville upon his move. This made the robbery close to the perfect crime as he didn't want the feds looking into his books. Not much had been heard from him since his move to Virginia until recently when he attended an old friend's birthday party. It was so fire. Bro, Shank's party was the fucking litest shit I've ever been to, bro. Dude, I can't believe the cops didn't bust that shit down. So many people came over and definitely, I think, over 100 people. Total alcohol party, tons of hookers, tons of blow. We got some fat chicks coming in a little late, but it was great. And then I like, somehow convinced him when it was high, like, high enough, I convinced him to fucking call uh, Rachel and Constance because they were in Boston. They may or may not have smashed. About halfway through the party, I turn, I turn away, look back over to the main table. People are gathering around. Shane's got 21 shots of whiskey on the table. Kid you not, this man downs him in approximately five minutes. I, I didn't even know a man could even fucking do that. Like, I didn't even know someone had the capabilities of doing that shit, bro. And this man was going out and fucking killing the game that night, dude. Without a doubt, fucking crazy ass night. But even such a great party had its fair share of suspect characters. Was there anyone who rubbed you the wrong way at the party? Honestly, if I had to think about it, there's probably only one person at that entire party who rubbed me the wrong way. And that was no one other than Nick. I walk into the party, I'm dapping everyone up, saying hello, giving happy birthdays all around. And Nick's just standing in the corner, man. He's just staring at me. Just stare. I would walk, walk to the side, still staring at me. I'd look over, try to make eye contact with him. He would turn down to his drink. Clearly, he was trying to size me up from a distance. Probably the last straw for me with Nick was when he started talking about Bruce Buskett. Now, we don't really talk about Bruce Buskett too much, because obviously he had a past identity, but we don't really bring him up too much. We keep him hidden. But somehow, Nick knew everything about Bruce Buskett and was trying to get me to crack the entire night. He asked me subtle questions. So I'm trying to slip something in my drink. Might have been a roofie. I don't know for sure. But all I can say is major sus vibes from Nick. Nick Shaw is a friend of Shang's from the Boston area. Shaw and Shang met in college while both participating in the off-roading club. Oh, yeah! From the start, the two were nearly inseparable. They attended all the same meetings, lived in the same house, tried to have matching schedules, and occasionally even landed the same birds after each other. This friendship, along with his many questions about Bruce Buskett, began to create some suspicion about Nick's behavior towards Michael that night. Nick and I were friends for so long, I would say. We're almost brothers. Sometimes we hang out so much that people can't even tell we, we aren't related. Oh man, Shang and I go way back. We've known each other for so long, but I gotta be honest, I don't know who the hell invited Mike to the party. He was being pretty freaking annoying. You do realize that it was Shang's birthday party, right? Yeah, I know, but he was being way too friendly with Shang, dude. He, he was on him the whole time. He wouldn't give him a breath of air. He was just being way too clingy, dude. I don't know, I've never been a big fan of him. It, it made me wanna like just steal money from him or just rip him off or something, I don't know. Nick's a big money guy, I mean, that's basically all he fucking talks about every time. It's just, it's so fucking annoying, huh? It's so fucking annoying. Every time we're talking about sports and stuff, you always bring up money, like, just middle of nowhere. I hate it. Like, he always compare it, like, oh, I have so much money, you know? I wouldn't be surprised that he wanna just get all Mike's money, you know? So Shaw had the motive to steal, but did he have the means to pull off such an elaborate heist? And would he even need to do so? What do you have to say to the people who think you might have been the one who stole from Michael Ross? Whoever says that is obviously dumb, it doesn't know shit. I, I don't need to steal, I got so much money, stealing money would just be a waste of time for me. I know I might have said it, but that doesn't mean I did anything. I would say that's true. Nick doesn't really need any money anymore, you know? He's pretty rich. I don't really think it's his money, it's more like his parents' money, you know? Nah, Nick would never steal. He, like, he, like, he doesn't do anything for himself. Like, like, he straight up just pays people to do favors for him. Like, 
Really? At, at the fucking D Hall, he just, he literally paid someone five bucks just to get him a, an omelet from the omelet station. So if Nick had no reason to steal, who else could be a suspect? One notable absence from the party was that guy, Matt. Shang Will are always talking about Matt, how cool of a guy he is, how fucking sweet he is. I'm like, I must, I'm probably gonna run into him at Shang's 21st, right? I get there, I'm walking around for about a half an hour. No sight of the kid. I ask around, apparently he's with his girlfriend that night, but no one's with their girlfriend on the night of Shang's 21st birthday, so something doesn't add up there. With all of these mutual friends attending Shang's party, Matt Wazowski was a surprising no-show. Close friends with Shang as well. It was confusing as to why he might not have attended. Matt, oh my gosh. What a bitch, you know? Like, I invited him to my birthday party, he didn't come. Like, that's a totally fucker movie, you know what I'm saying? Like, he didn't pay the respect. He, I think he's probably just sitting in his, in his dorm and just doing, like, his computer shit all day. It's my birthday though, like, you know, you can't just do hacking shit, like, on his computer all the time. No, yeah, it, it was it was kind of sketchy that Matt didn't show up to the party, you know, he's, he's one of the boys, you know, you expect to see a couple of the boys coming back to slam some brews on good old Shangy Bangy's, uh, birthday, you know? As an exiled member of the infamous hacking group Lizard Squad, Wazowski is well known for his hacking abilities amongst his peers as he constantly doxes people for fun. Bro, Matt, oh my fucking god, alright, alright. Like, he does this thing on a wreck where he like, literally just doxes you, like, you will just do like the smallest thing to piss that kid off, like, I, I, I once just beat him 2-1, 2-1 in FIFA. Alright, it was 90 seconds sweaty goal, but like, you know, no big deal, I fucking beat him 2-1. And he just proceeds to have my TikTok and post like all about me, like my fucking social security number, all my fucking passwords, and like he does this on the break, like he does this like like so fucking often, like I've had to change my fucking passwords and everything and relogging the shit just because of that fucking kid. Matt tried to leak my information once. He he leaked it through a club penguin ad, so I ended up having to go pay old Tony Two Face to go take care you know what I mean, of the people who saw all the information online. Long story short, Matt realized he can't really fuck with me because I got so much money that I'm going to be able to beat him no matter what he tries. All of this information only makes it more suspicious as to why Matt might not have showed up, especially considering that it was well known that Michael Ross, the rich philanthropist, would be in attendance that night. Matt definitely did it. I know for a fact. He definitely did it. Really? This is huge news. How, how do you know this? Well, like... I don't know for certain, but he's been ignoring my texts and basically being such an asshole, so, I mean, he basically had to have done it. Oh wait, that's him now. Completely disregard everything I said. He's such a great guy. We didn't originally think that we would be able to get in contact with Matt because of how he's basically off the grid, but he eventually reached out and we were luckily able to bring him in for a few questions. Can you uh, move that bong off the out of the way, please? Um, this is actually a therapy bing. Uh, I actually really need it. Um, it's kind of life or death with Rona and everything going I, on. I, I, okay, it's still a bong. Yeah, I I, it's, it's not a bong, actually. It's really just a therapy animal. Um, it's a lap dog, and it just sits on my lap all day. So you know what? Right. Okay. So, first question, why weren't you at Shang's birthday party? Bro, just don't worry. It's none of your business, honestly. Like, I just didn't want to go. You do realize that people are accusing you of having stolen from Michael Ross and, you know, not answering the question kind of leads us to assume that you're uh, guilty. Uh, I was just like, some Fiji, Fiji thing. What? Bro, fuck, I was at a Fiji thing, all right? Fuck you, dude. Leave you weren't there. Fuck you. At Northeastern, Fiji is a fraternity that is known to be one of the strangest frats on campus. Typically, the only people who attend their events are usually underage girls and dudes who competitively vape, quote unquote. So it kind of makes sense why Matt would want to cover this up. Wait, are you serious? Oh my gosh. The fuck? A Fiji party? For real? I just hope you get arrested for this, to be honest. What a bit. But the question still remains as to why Matt would skip one of his close friend's birthday parties for a Fiji party of all parties. And also, was Shang alluding to the fact that he wanted Matt to be convicted? Well, for starters, Matt is known to have connections to Fiji and attends events somewhat frequently. So why did you go to a Fiji party? I mean, I know that there's like a bunch of rumors and allegations going on, but trust me, I'm not gay. I only went so I could hang with Asha. 
Um, she really wanted to go meet some like famous vape or some bullshit they had going on. So I was like, fuck it, I guess I'll go. Uh, I simped, you know, what am I gonna do about it? It's just how it, it's just how it is some days. And his alibi checked out as these pictures were taken that night at the Fiji event he was attending. So, with Matt having established himself at Fiji for the evening, we are left to look at Shang Meng, the man who'd been throwing on tons of allegations towards other people of having stolen from Michael, but never seemed to take any responsibility for himself. I wouldn't be surprised that he wanna just get all Mike's money, you know? I just hope he get arrested for this, to be honest. As host of the party, Shang spent his night talking with nearly everyone who attended, and for the most part, he seemed content with his conversations. To be honest, I was kind of pissed at Mike for not giving me a birthday present, but... I mean, he, he's making big bucks, you know, like... I think it's totally fine to give me 100 bucks, you know, just... At the party, Shang was giving me some weird vibes. I mean, I wasn't, I definitely wasn't expecting this going in. I hadn't seen him in a long time. I was hoping he'd be excited to see me. When I get there and I dap him up, kind of looked at me, was asking like, oh, did you bring anything? I was like, oh, no, I'm here for your party, man. And he kind of was like, oh, okay, and then walked away. And the rest of the party was just acting real strange to me. I'd come over to try to talk, he'd turn away, try to get him a drink. He'd accidentally trip over the carpet and spill it all over himself. I mean, it was, it was very strange and very unshang like I mean, looking back on it, I wonder if I did something to piss him off or maybe there was something else at play there, but very weird sus vibes looking back on the party. Shang was super heated about Mike not getting him a present. Every time I tried to talk to him, he was always bringing it up. I don't really get it though, because no one else got him a present, so it doesn't make sense to me. The, the only reason I invited Mike because he said he was lonely, so I'm being a nice guy, just invited him to the party, but end up just start hitting on everyone's girlfriend. I'm like, whoa, dude, you gotta show it there, you know? It seems like he only hit on girls when they're in a relationship, you know? Like, if you're single, he's not interested. But once you have a boyfriend, different story. Shang's discontent with Michael was definitely suspicious. Could Shang have stolen from Michael as a way to essentially give himself a birthday present from Mike? We decided to confront him with our theory and see what he had to say. Me? You're insane, what are you talking about? That's so stupid. I only use Bitcoin, you know that. I only use Bitcoin. Yeah, that's true. Take a look at how he spends money. He only uses Bitcoin. He can be super annoying because he refuses any other form of payments. And whenever he has to pay us with stuff and he pays in Bitcoin, the value is always changing. Super annoying. And his excuse checks out. Taking a look at Shang's finances, you can see that he hasn't held a cent of US currency in over 10 years. All of his transactions have been made through Bitcoin, ranging from minor purchases like groceries and clothes, all the way up to paying his college tuition. But if Shang, nor Nick, nor Matt stole from Mike, who did? Well, another common theory is that Ross might have been kind of irresponsible with his money. So how is Mike with his money? He's really irresponsible, I would say. Um, just a couple years before, for my birthday, can you believe that? He got me a mirror of Kim Jong-un and like a CD record with a, what is it? Oh, BTS. Like, I'm not fucking Korean. I'm Chinese. Like, no, no, no disrespect, but like, does Ni Hao sound like Anasio? I don't think that's the same, right? I think he's a little bit racist too, to be honest. Bro, Mike's a fucking dumbass with his money, bro. I swear to God, we were playing poker. Man goes all in on his first hand, like, and loses. He's out for the rest of the game. And we were, the pot was fucking 500, bro. He fucking gives up all his 500 bucks all in one go because he thought he had a good fucking hand. When someone beat him with two pairs, bro, I swear to God, kid does not. I, dude, I don't even know if he knows how to play poker. I don't know why he joined in. And he went in all in on his first. Bro, I swear to God, man. Kid's a dumbass. I played soccer for like 10, 12 years of my life, and at a bonfire, he once bet me 200 bucks that I couldn't juggle it five times. And like, I fucking took his money. Like, $200, like, yeah, he's just bad with me. Quavo and I were up at the pong table. We hit a streak. We probably beat like three other teams in a row. And then Michael decides to come up and challenge us, acting like a total idiot, making an ass out of himself. He comes up, takes a couple of shots, proves that he has the depth perception of a blind shark, challenges us, betting Ian's birthday present on the game. And long story short, we got the Rolex.
bitch. All of this was speculation and the investigation was essentially dead in the water until we received a call from Bruce Buskett again. Hey man, so I, uh, I, I probably should have brought this up and I, I, I genuinely just blanked on it. But when you were asking me about Mike, I, sh- I should have mentioned it. I forgot. I mean, we, we still keep in touch. I mean, I, you know, we text, you know, I talk to him a lot. He, um, helps run the business out of Amishville, Virginia. And uh, being as I'm on Wall Street, I, I handle the rest, but we still keep in touch. You know, I think it's for the best, just, but I just thought you should know. After hearing this message, we immediately had to bring Bruce back in for questioning. Right, so thanks for bringing me back in. I mean, I'm always happy to share what I know, but since you asked, uh, Mikey sends me blow from out in the show, and I, I mean, I trap it out on Wall Street. And, you know, it actually makes me a nice living for, from the Wall Street guys. I mean, they eat this shit up. You know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before bed bumps all around for everybody. You know, it's good money. But sometimes when these guys do just completely ridiculous things, you know, Tesla puts betting against Jeff Bezos and Amazon, they're, they're cash strapped. And sometimes they give me that, in, just that nice insider info on stocks. And, you know, and it, it's made me really good investing. It's made me really profitable. But and I digress. <laughs> Back to Mike. Um, you know, if you, if you look at this portfolio, I'm, I'm dead su- I am dead sure that you're going to see some dumbass stuff on there. You know, he never takes my advice on this type of thing. And would you look at that? Mike lives in, in Amishville, and I, and I get to sit at my desk at Wall Street telling you how profitable I am. Luckily for us, Bruce was able to take a look at Ross's portfolio and detailed some of the investments he had been making. So, uh, I know I mentioned that Mikey definitely has made questionable investment decisions. And I, I talked to his uh, brokerage, I, I, I know a guy. And they told me some of the stuff that he was invested in, and my lord, it'll make your eyes water. I mean, this is the man that invested in Delta at the height of a pandemic, because his logic was that people would just be flying away from their home countries to not get sick. And then Delta proceeds to ground well over half their flights, and he's just left with a, with a gaping loss. I mean, he invested in Cody Makeup. That was his first investment after we left high school. That was bad. I told him to take Alta. Alta expanded it really well. Increased their sales and he invested in Cody and they've lost 85% over the last five years. And he still maintains it's a good investment because it has Kim Kardashian on the cover. He uh, invested in Valero. I, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, that, that was sketchy. That was... Part of a deal for a couple kilos of that uh, of that nice book of sugar he got back in high school. It was uh, you know, the cartel boys said, "Yo, Mike, you buy you buy five pounds of blow. I give you I give you the stock options too." He he takes the thing. Of course he took it. He took the stock options. He he and now he owns shares of Valero, and I mean he invested in Nicholas Maduro's shit ass gas company. And the man tried. He's been assassinated twice. The entire West wants him gone and they don't even have a functional government and he still thinks that it's a good investment. Because he got to pay homage to the boys down in Caracas. I don't know. They lost 31.6%. I, I can name 25 other companies that aren't sanctioned to do a better business than they do. I mean, the straw that broke the camel's back, he actually invested in, in Cheesecake Factory in the middle of a pandemic thinking that a diverse menu would bring in more patrons who came when all the mom and pop stores are closed down. Well, he, he just kind of didn't realize that they haven't, haven't been paying their rent in the last couple of months. They lost 45% over the last year. And he still maintains that because Pasta Da Vinci remains on their menu, Cheesecake Factory remains in his portfolio. Uh, I mean, eh, I mean, just when he crunched the numbers and, and like he actually found a way to invest in the four butt babies of the stock market and still thinks that he's okay. Well, Mike, newsflash for you. Like, you kind of fucked up. You lost $69,420, half your starter portfolio coming out of high school. And I mean, you have no one to blame. He has no one to blame but himself. It was just one bad investment after another and, and the world is now to get him. He, he got himself. One bad investment after another will do it to you. Wait from your sleep. The drying of your tears Today we escape We escape